Listen to me, if you're here tonight and you've got pain in your body, any kind of pain, back pain, joint pain, I don't care, just pain. Everybody say pain. Jesus has already carried our pains, right? You got pain in your body, come down here. They're gonna sing the song, the healer's in the house right now, amen? Hallelujah, come on down, hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. How many believe pain is gonna leave? Amen. Because of what Jesus did, right? Jesus himself took our infirmities and by our sicknesses, by his stripes, we are healed. Hallelujah. Everybody say, Jesus is a healer. Jesus is a miracle worker. I believe when hands are laid on, that pain is gonna leave. And whatever was causing the pain, and whatever was causing the pain will, be healed. will be healed in Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Because Jesus, Jesus is the healer. Is the healer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now stay with that song because you know there's something powerful when you start thinking about the fact that you, you, little old you, can walk in there right into the Holy of Holies. What was it, 2,500 years, nobody could go in there but the high priest. <laughs> Till the high priest ripped that curtain, that veil from top to bottom. Now you and I can walk right in there in the presence of God, he's here, that's right. he's here right now. Are you ready to receive? Because he's coming, amen, right now. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Now I can go. Coming real strong. Ushers, get ready. Jesus, the 
of the healing.
Amen. Not pridefully. Amen. But boldly. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. All right. Everybody, you can be seated. Everybody that was prayed for, if you uh, if your pain's already gone, you can tell the difference. Raise your hand. We want to make sure. Amen. One, two, three. Amen. Rest of us on the way. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, if you weren't here this morning, <laughs> uh, view at your own risk. And I got went home, I was sitting there, I said, Geraldine, uh, what are you going to do when they come for me? She said, I'm going to say, here he is. So I just thought you might want to know how little uh, protection I have at the house. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> She's glad. Thank God I'm covered. Amen. Uh, yeah, there he is. Take him away. Hallelujah. Praise God. You know, it's interesting. I went home, got on Facebook today. And there was a report on there by George Barna. Now, did you, anybody see that besides me? And the report, you know who George Barna is, right? He's like the number one researcher in the nation. He studies churches and ministries and so forth and so on. So they had done a survey. And what they did is they surveyed ministers, pastors. And they, the question was, um, do you address political issues from your pulpit or do you tell your people what the Bible says and uh, about certain political issues let's just use uh, abortion as, a, as an example or homosexuality you know and listen to this I know you hear this a lot but I'm just telling you what the report said the report said that 90% of ministers I would assume pastors, 90% of them know the political issues and know what the Bible says about it, but 90% will not tell their people what it says. Only 10%, only 10% out of 100% will even tell their people what the Bible says about certain political issues. Amen. So I just thought it was interesting after this morning that you go home and you find that, you know. That's a, I'm into 10%. I don't know what that means. Hallelujah. It's good. He said it's good, so I guess it's good. Amen. Uh, if you weren't in here this morning, we, uh, we've gone down to uh, 105,000 now. Amen. And just since we started... In May, when, when we started, uh, you know, we've given like, we, you, us, we've given $25,000 since then. And it has saved us $8,000, well, $8,003. $8,000, we've already saved $8,000 in interest. Uh, June, July, well, two and a half months, we've saved $8,000 in interest. Amen. So that's $8,000 that God's going to get that the bank's not. Amen. Hallelujah. So I want you to keep your faith out there with me now. Because, see, we're, we've got our faith out there that this thing's going to be paid off by next May. We, we said a year, right? And uh, believe some money in. Use your faith. I mean, if all else fails, lose your faith. Amen. If you have to, pray. Amen. I mean, if it comes to that, do what you have to do. How's Perry doing? Perry doing okay? Amen. Amen. Is he, did he come home? Did he come home? He's at home. He's a good man. He's a good man. Uh, Marinelle's a good woman. I've known them since, see, I was a little guy. Uh, the way I met them, I was playing Little League Baseball. And Perry was one of the coaches. He coached the Tigers. What? No, 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 no. Uh, what? Huh? Was it the Dodgers? He, he coached. Yeah, Ray remembers it. Amen. Ray's an old man like me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. 
So every time I get to feeling old, I look back at it right. <laughs> no, I'm feeling a little, you know, you know I, Ray and I remember when they built the first schoolhouse over there. You remember that? Oh, Jesus. Now we built, went, went, went through one and built another. Hallelujah. But yeah, uh, Perry and Mary Nell, I remember them very well. Very well. Uh, helping uh, kids. Always involved in something like that, you know, uh, where, where kids was concerned. So, yeah, we've been praying for them and uh, others that we're praying for also. Amen. Well, God's good, right? Are you ready to give tonight? Well, uh, it's all right for Holy Ghost to move when, uh, when on leadership night, isn't it? Well, of course it is. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Why don't you go ahead and stand up on your feet? Well, there's always, you know, we're not under the law. So we're not under the law of the time. Under the, under the Old Testament, you tithe because you were under law. We don't tithe because we're under law. We tithe because we believe what the Word says. And the Word says that we're blessed. Amen. Hallelujah. And so now we do it by faith. We don't do it to get something, although we will get something. But see, our hearts have to be purified. You know, we have to have the right heart when it comes to giving. The Bible said, let every man uh, give as he purposes in his heart. And your heart is where your value system is. It's where your priorities stem from. Amen. And when God's first, then he's going to get the first fruits, right? Well, let's pray. Father, we love you. And we thank you, Lord, that there's more than enough money to do what you want done. And we thank you, Lord God, we call this place debt free debt free in the name of Jesus and Lord we give you praise Lord we thank you Lord that when we give out of the heart that's right and faith we know that there's a return that belongs to us and we call it in we receive it by faith in the name of Jesus and all the people said amen amen bring your tithes and offerings
his stripes and healed. Chastisement of our peace was upon him. So we don't have to be tormented, do we? Don't have to be sick, do we? No, we don't. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, I've got an I've got an announcement. I don't I should have announced this earlier. But Apostle David loves homegrown garden tomatoes. And Brother Randall has just, his is about run out. So if there's anybody here, it's coming in. May the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you. Amen. Well, you remember that the first fruits go to the priest now. Amen. <laughs> And we're all kings and priests, but I'm the, I'm the main one, okay? Hallelujah, Jesus. Amen. Praise God. Well, you know, you, I'm just telling you the truth. The, the garden tomatoes are good, aren't they? <laughs> Hallelujah. So is everything else comes out of the garden, really. But look, we, we've had, been having a great time on Sunday night. I've heard some, some, heard some wonderful teaching on leadership. Um, Linda's going to teach tonight. Pray for her. She's been, you know, she had an open house today and had to stand up for two hours over there and didn't get home till late. And uh, so she needs strength in her body. But how many knows the Lord is uh, here, our strength in her? Amen? Amen. Amen. How many of you are ready to hear some good teaching on leadership? We've heard that's some great already. Amen. Amen. Wonderful teaching. Praise the Lord. Um, come on, Linda. Amen. Just uh, as Brother Hagin would say, give us what you got. Let me just start off tonight by saying that Apostle lied to y'all this morning because the last thing he said this morning before he left is that, um, you know, somebody nice was going to be up here preaching tonight. So I just looked at him and was like, you know it's me. Why are you saying that? You're setting those people up for false expectation. That's not good. Um, I am going to sit down while I'm teaching tonight. I hope that's all right with y'all. So I'm going I'm to do it anyway, whether it is or not. So, But I, got, I just got to say something before I get started tonight. But if you guys ever paid attention to our praise team during an altar call, and, I mean, if they have need of something that's being prayed for, have you ever watched them, like, swap out with each other the whole time? Isn't that amazing? I just, last week when Brother Randy was here and every single one of them came down to um, you know, to receive prayer. I mean, they did, they never missed a beat. If you had your eyes closed, you wouldn't have known that anybody that they'd swapped up singers. They swapped up keyboardists like three times. They, I mean, I mean, they just go and they pick up different instruments. They move from the drums to the microphone to the guitar to the keyboard and back. It's amazing. I mean, and we're so blessed. I was just, I was thinking about that last week. I was just kind of in awe of that, and I thought. Most people just put on a tape and let the people come on down. You know what I'm saying? And um, there's nothing wrong with tapes. I mean, sometimes tapes are good, but you know how it is here. I mean, a lot of times there's a strong anointing on a particular song. And so they just, you know, they just are true to that anointing and they just flow with it. I think it's exceptional. Amen. I just, I'm, I'm really excited that that kind of thing is also getting captured by the internet ministry because, you know, people can teach, you can teach your people to do things like that. They didn't always do that. Amen. And that just, that comes out of a unity amongst them as a team and a, and a sincere desire to, to make sure that Holy Ghost is present at all times. Amen. So that's just, it's awesome. We ought to really just thank God for what we have because it is not everywhere. Amen. It is not everywhere. Why don't you um, open your Bibles with me to Second Chronicles. We're going to kind of carry along with the same theme that Brother Randy started last week as far as looking at the Old Testament for some types and shadows of what the apostolic church is supposed to be. Second Chronicles on page 564 in my Bible. As Apostle David says, just use your table of contents. You'll get there. Those of you who are using uh, iPads and iPhones and all that stuff, it's so much easier. You just push one button and you're just right there to the right spot. All right, so in Second Chronicles chapter 7, I want to talk to you tonight about something that is, it's, very important. We say that, you know, I think Apostle said even this morning, you know, we have a, a leadership crisis in the body of Christ today. Can everybody say amen? amen? Well, one of the reasons that we have a leadership crisis in the body of Christ today is because the leaders, the so-called leaders in the body of Christ are lacking one of the key elements of leadership. And that key element is humility. Okay, it's humility. 
So I was going to talk about something else, or at least I thought I was going to talk about something else, but this has just really been on my heart for the last few days, so we're going to talk about this tonight instead. We're going to talk about humility. And as a matter of fact, I wish that um, I had brought with me my copy, but one of the things, whenever some of the younger leaders around or there are the young people who aspire to grow in leadership come to me and they ask my advice about things, then one of the very first things, one of the first texts that I point them to is a book called Humility by Andrew Murray. And it's a tremendous book. Sometimes we have it in the bookstore. I don't know, Miss Barbara, if we've got it back there or not. But it's a tremendous lesson. It totally changed my life, transformed my, my thinking. And here's why. Because at a point in my Christian walk, earlier on in my Christian walk, when I knew that I had a call of God on my life and I knew that, um, that there was an anointing to preach and to teach and I had begun to flow in that gift, what I thought was, automatically, I thought that because God anointed me in a certain area, I thought that I was a leader, okay? And so when we came here, I had already been in a position of leadership in another place. I had already been anointed to preach and teach, and so I just automatically assumed, therefore, that I was a leader we came here to this church, and one of the very first things that I had the opportunity to do back in way back in 1997 was Apostle David invited my husband and I to go along with him, Pastor Bill, and I don't remember if Miss Gail went or not too, just Pastor Bill, I think, a couple other people who were in leadership here at the time, and there was just about five or six of us, and we went to John Maxwell over in Atlanta. And, you know, this is what I thought. I'm going to a leadership conference to validate everything I know about leadership so that my husband will know when he, that man is down there talking about what good leaders are, my husband will know that I was right all along and that I'm a good leader and that he should listen to me because I knew what leadership was all about. I mean, really, this is what I'm thinking in the back of my mind. Now, I, did, I would never have verbalized that, right? I would never have said that, and I never really would have been in the forefront of my thinking because it was just very, it was a very low undercurrent behind what I was thinking. I thought I knew what leadership was all about. And I pulled out, I think I even brought it with me. I pulled out this afternoon, I pulled out, yeah, this is, here it is right here. This is a throwback. You can even tell this is printed in the 90s because it doesn't look like anything that's printed today. We got this packet one of the, on the first night when Apostle wanted to start teaching on leadership. He, I think he talked about the five different levels of leadership, right? And he talked about, you know, those, those different levels and just kind of touched on those briefly. Didn't go into them very in-depth because he hit on a lot of things that night. But this is the paper that changed my life, okay? And the reason it is is because we were sitting there in this leadership conference, and I'm feeling super good about myself because the man right here, invited me to go to a leadership conference, so therefore he must know that I am a leader. <laughs> what I found out in about the first 20 minutes is that he knew that I could be a leader, but I wasn't, okay? And he might not even have known that conscientiously yet at that point in time, but I know he knew it by the Spirit because we got this piece of paper. This is about the first thing that John Maxwell started going through was his five le levels of leadership. And I started filling this out. And if you're looking up close, you can see how much of this is filled out, James, as far as those little steps go. Just the bottom one, right? The first level of leadership, that's all I got to, just on the bottom, because I was just in shock. It was just like Holy Ghost slapped me. I mean, really. Apostle asked me a few minutes ago if I've ever been slapped in the face with a microphone. I was like, no, but I've been slapped in the face by Holy Ghost plenty of times. And one of the things that he slapped me in the face with on back then in 1997 was this thought that I thought I was a leader, and I found out pretty quick that I was not a leader. And the, and the biggest thing that was standing in the way is because the second level of leadership has to do with relationships. You have to be able to have relationships with people in order to go to the second level of leadership. And I was good at bossing people around. I was real good at that. I was very good at articulating what needed to happen, and I could tell people what needed to happen. I could point here, there, and yawn, but I didn't have relationships with the people that I was pointing to, and therefore, I was still on the lowest level of leadership. I sat, that, that seminar right there ended up being a torment to me because, and I, I just flipped through. As a matter of fact, I thought when I went and got the book of it today, because, you know, I get those big leadership packets. Remember that? I've got, it's the Burgundy one from 97. So I, had, I went to get that Burgundy um, book out of the closet in my study. 
I got it down, and I remembered after I opened it up today, that that's the only peace of mind that I saved. I got so frustrated with it that I threw mine away. Serious. I threw it out. We don't need two. Dave's the only one who filled all of his out, so we kept Dave's instead. And the whole thing, I'm looking through that, and I'm looking at all that stuff, and I just remember how I was sitting there just being so shocked that, you know, that really that, you know, I was lacking in so many areas of leadership. But this is one of the things that's wonderful about leadership. It can be taught. It can be taught. Every single person can grow in leadership. Every person. Okay? But one of the things that I found out in my own leadership journey was that you cannot, you can only grow in leadership to the degree that you humble yourself to receive whatever instruction that you need. If you're not willing to walk in humility, then you will never be a leader. Period. I said, period. If you look at some of those videos that Apostle and Brother Randy and others have been talking about, you know, for the last few weeks, if you look at some of those videos, one of the, one of the personality traits that comes across the strongest to me in all of these people who are following after the Kundalini spirit and falling into error in the body of Christ and have been for the last 10 or 15 years, this is nothing new. It's not like this is just happening. But the, one of the key personality traits that's so evident is pride. They're just so full of pride, right? I mean, even to the point this morning, an apostle was talking about, you know, the errors in the prosperity message. And I was thinking back to how when um, this thing about the Pope came up and I went back and I looked at the Southwest Believers Convention from just last month, you know, and the piece that I pulled up had Jerry Savelle standing up there in a solid gold suit. I was like, dude, this is not the 70s. What do you wear a solid gold suit for? The only reason you're wearing a solid gold suit is because you want to draw attention to yourself. That has nothing to do with God. It has nothing to do with God. You know who the one person in the Bible was that decorated themselves all up in some jewels and some gold and stuff like that and exalted themselves? You know who that person was, right? It was Lucifer, right? Okay. So, I mean, that's not the kind of, that's not the way that we want to go. That's not the model that we want. And so, you know, because of those things that have been brought forth in conversation and just because I know myself and I know the, the leadership journey that I've been on for the last 20 years just about, and, you know, and I know that humility is one of those things that is one of the biggest keys. If you want to grow as a leader, you must develop humility more in your life. You might have humility operating in your life to a degree today, but all of us can develop more humility. And in order to do that, you kind of have to know what it is. I mean, because there is a false humility that is just as prideful as just plain old regular pride. <laughs> so here we are. We, you should be in Second Chronicles chapter 7. I want to just establish um, some scriptural foundation. Those of you who are with me on Wednesday nights, you know this is the way I like to teach. I like to go to the Word first, amen, and get us a nice solid foundation, and then we'll just, we'll, we'll talk through some things, okay? So in Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14 says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, humble themselves. Everybody say humble themselves. Does it say that God's going to humble them? Does it say that they need to humble their neighbor? Does it say humble your spouse, humble your child? No. It says humble themselves. In other words, you have to humble yourself. It's not your job to humble me, your spouse, your kid, or anybody else. It's your job to humble yourself. So if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Well, does our land need healing today? Okay, well, what was the very first thing that he said that we must do in order to receive that answer to that prayer in order for us to receive healing in the land? We've got to humble ourselves. Amen. So if God put something first in here, don't you think that that might be a priority to him? Go over in the same, um, in the same book, go to Second Chronicles chapter 34. And I'm going to kind of summarize here a story about King Josiah. We're not going to read this whole entire chapter, but um, we're going to read sections of it, and I'll just kind of fill you in in between. Go back and read it on your own. It's a good story. So in Second Chronicles chapter 34, you know, if you, have, if you read through um, the Old Testament, you know that the children of Israel, it's not like they learned their lesson one time in their rebellion in the wilderness, and then they learned their lesson in 40 years, and from then on they were all obedient, because that didn't happen. And before you start pointing fingers at them, think about your own self. 
I mean, think about the lessons that you've had to learn in your walk with God. It's not like you learn it just one time and then you're all obedient. It wouldn't be nice if it worked out that way. You know, I mean, all we had to do was face something one time and then we never had to face it again. Anybody ever been through something more than one time? I mean, come on. I mean, if you're honest, then you'd say, yeah. So here we go. So here they've been through many cycles of, um, of rebellion and disobedience and punishment and judgment and all kinds of stuff is going on. But here we have um, King Josiah. So in chapter 34, verse 1, it says, Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. Imagine a leader who does the right thing in the sight of the Lord. Just imagine that for a minute because it is possible. Okay? It is possible. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of his father David. He did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. For in the eighth year of his reign, so he was eight when he started, so that means when this, when this guy was 16 years old, this is what he did. While he was still young, he began to seek the God of his father David. And in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, the wooden images, the carved images, and the molded images. They broke down the altars of the Baals in his presence, and the incense altars which were above them he cut down. And the wooden images, the carved images, and the molded images he broke in pieces and made dust of them and scattered it on the graves of those who had sacrificed to them. He also burned the bones of the priests on their altars and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. So here he was, he was a young man. And what he began to do is he began to purge the sin out of the land. He began to tear down the idols, okay? Tear down the altars made to false idols, right? He began to take care of all those things. So after a season of time, after about 18 years, what he, it took him about 18 years to cleanse the land of its sin. Well, guys, I mean, we're facing a crisis here in the United States of America today. We're actually facing a worldwide crisis as far as Christian dumb is concerned. Could you all say amen? So it's not going to be overnight that these things are done. It took him 18 years. If I say 18 years. It took him 18 years for him to have his people get rid of all of the devil worship, basically, that was going on. Okay, 18 years. And then what he did was he sent money then to repair the altar of God. Okay, so he sent money in, um, he got it into the hands of the right people to make sure that the laborers were actually getting paid to repay, to uh, repair the house of God. And in the process of that time, the priests there, they found the book of the law buried deep in the, the rubble of the house of God. All right. Well, I mean, just picture all this. This is an Old Testament. Think about what Brother Randy said last week. Old Testament types and shadows of what's going on in the church today. Okay. So if you think about that today, there's sin in the land. There's idol worship in the land, right? There's, there's false prophets in the land. There are people who have lusted after the, the things of their own flesh, and they've set up laws, and they've set up ordinances, and they've changed. They've infiltrated the church, and they've tried to make everything real easy, right? Just like it was with the Baals. That's what it was, all right? So they begin to follow after the flesh. Instead, they allowed the house of God to crumble, to fall apart, Okay? But deep, deeply buried inside the house of God was the truth, right? Was the law, the law of God, the book of the law. So they find the book of the law and they bring it back to the king and they read it to him. And so in verse 19, it says, just jump down to verse 19. It says, thus it happened when the king heard the words of the law that he tore his clothes. Okay. What that means in our modern terms is that he repented. He didn't just, he didn't repent. Now, this was a just man, a righteous man, a man who from his childhood had served God. He wasn't repenting for himself. He was repenting for the nation. Okay. So like when you hear stuff like this morning, you hear Apostle David, his heart crying out, right, for repentance in the church. It's the same spirit. It's the spirit. It's like a spirit of Josiah being there, crying out, renting his clothes, renting his heart before the Lord because of the condition of the church. Right. So Josiah calls out, you know, to God, he's repenting over the condition of the church. And he sends um, he sends the priests down to a prophetess who was prophesying in Israel. And this is what she said. If you jump on down here to verse um, 26. What she says is, um, well, if you just look at the very last line there of uh, verse 25, she's prophesying what the Lord is saying. And the Lord says, therefore, my wrath will be poured out on this place and it will not be quenched. In other words, there's still going to be judgment to come for the sins of the nation. Okay. 
Still going to be judgment to come for the sins of the nation. But, verse 26, but as for the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, in this manner you shall speak to him. So in other words, to Josiah, this is what you're going to tell him. Thus says the Lord God of Israel concerning the words which you have heard. Because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before God when you heard his words against this place and against its inhabitants, and you humbled yourself before me, and you tore your clothes and wept before me, I also have heard you, says the Lord. What was it that caused God in the midst of a, of a godless nation? What was it that caused God to hear a man? It was his humility. Okay, he is the leader of this nation. It was his humility. It wasn't his kingship. All right, it wasn't his power, it wasn't his authority, it wasn't his great oratorical skills, it was his humility that caused God to hear him, okay? And this is what the Lord said, he says in verse 28, he says, surely I will gather you to your fathers and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace, and your eyes shall not see all the calamity which I will bring on this place and its inhabitants. Because of his humility, okay? So can we agree then that humility is an important aspect of leadership? Those five of you that said yes, good. The rest of y'all just keep thinking on that for a minute because maybe a couple more scriptures will help you. Turn over to Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs 16. I'm going to read verse 18. It's 18 and 19. Very familiar passage of scripture. Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. See, it doesn't, it really should not confuse you too much when you see men and women who claim to be men and women of God fall in this day. If you just go look at them and you look at videos of what they're saying and what they're doing, you can see the pride, that the, the arrogance that is in their in their ministry, that's in their tone, that's in their words, right? You can see those things. And so when they fall, they fall because of that pride and arrogance. A haughty spirit goes before destruction. That's what the word says. I didn't make this up, okay? So why do they fall? They fall because they have a haughty spirit. Verse 19 says, Better to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. See, a lot of these guys and gals, I mean, they're, they're in this position. They have worked themselves into a position, and they believe that that place of position then guarantees them protection against destruction. And what happens then is they start to look down on people who are not in that place of position. Now, you know, Ann talked to you last week a lot about what leadership isn't, and she touched on some of these same kinds of concepts, you know, that, you know, when you look down on others, when you think of yourself being, you know, higher than others, that's not leadership, okay? And so, you know, but I've, I've seen this. I saw this. This is one of those things, one of those, um, one of those leadership um, characteristics that really drove me away from the Word of Faith churches because it was all this competition, you know, who's got the most gold jewelry? Who's got the biggest car? Who has the biggest house, right? Who gets to sit closest to Brother Hagen when they go out to camp meeting? Who gets to go have dinner with him? Who gets to sit at the table if you have somebody like Keith Moore or somebody like that come to the church? Who gets to sit at the table? I got to tell you something. I've sat at the table with Keith Moore, and he's a powerful minister, but he's a boring person, okay, right? I mean, you know, he just he doesn't really talk. And so, you know, it's, unless you want to carry the conversation around somebody like him, then you just might as well have gone home and ate at the house, have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, take a nap. I'm serious. But, you know, the thing of it is, is that there's this, there's this jostling, this jockeying back and forth for some kind of position at the table. I want a position at the table, okay? And, you know, it's a whole lot better to be of a humble spirit with those people who are lowly, and not lowly in God's eyes, but lowly in the eyes of the world, or lowly in the eyes of those who's, who um, are those who appear to be someone, but they're really nothing. That's what Paul says. You know, those who have the appearance of being someone, but they're really not anything. Right. All right. Now, turn over with me to Isaiah chapter 57. Isaiah 57. Go 
Going to read verse 15. You guys okay? You're pretty quiet tonight. All right, so verse 15 says, For thus says the high and lofty one. Who is the high and lofty one? It's not the man on the stage, y'all. This is God, okay? The high and lofty one, God, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit. Who does God dwell with? Those who have a contrite and a humble spirit. You know what? If you want to hang out more with God, you've got to develop the qualities and characteristics that he is attracted to. He's not attracted to just any kind of personality or any kind of quality or any kind of characteristic. He's attracted to those who have a humble spirit. And see, you know, you've got people in the ministry today who think that leadership is all about flash. It's all about charisma. It's all about, you know, just having this real sparkling, attractive personality to the masses. That's just called entertainment. Okay. I mean, that's just entertainment. I love movies. I love TV. I mean, I know what entertainment is. That's all that is, is entertainment, right? Okay. So, you know, so, so what God says is I'm going to live with those who have a contrite and humble spirit. He says to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. That's why he's, he wants to hang out with you to revive the heart of the humble and to revive the, the, the spirit of the contrite ones. See, so think about all the things that maybe you've done in the past to try to get God's attention. Think of all the things that you've watched people who are supposed to be in positions of leadership do in order to claim to have the anointing of God on their life. If it is not something that is reflective of a humble and a contrite spirit, then it ain't God. Because God is not attracted to those kinds of people. All right? I didn't say it, and he did. Turn with me to the New Testament, to Matthew chapter 23. It's there in the Old Testament. We've got the types and shadows. Don't want to leave out scriptures from the New Testament just for those people who are going to say, ah, well, that's just the Old Testament. I don't have to do that. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 12, Jesus said, now this is in red letters in my Bible, right? Red letters in your Bible? How many of you have red letters in Matthew 23? All right, so it's Jesus. And he says, whoever exalts himself will be humbled. (laughs) And he who humbles himself will be exalted. And see, we see that. We see it. We see it. We see it right now. You can just turn on what, I mean, I don't watch Christian TV and I haven't for a long time. Apostle says, you know, I should watch it every once in a while, but all I have to do is listen to him talking about watching it. It makes me mad. So why, why watch it? You know, I'll let him get mad. I'll let him watch it. I'll listen to what he has to say. But um, every once in a while, I do go on the internet and I look at some of the stuff, and I'm just, you know, I just shake my head. But, you know, what, what you notice is that those people who exalt themselves, well, a lot of them are humbled to the point of death right now. Serious. They're not here anymore. They're gone. They might be with Jesus. They might not be. You know what I'm saying? But they're not here anymore because they exalted themselves to a point that God had to remove his hand of protection on their life. And the enemy was able to come in and take him away. But he who humbles himself will be exalted. That's what Jesus said. Everybody say, that's what Jesus said. Turn with me to James chapter 4. James chapter 4. James 4, 6 says, but he, and this is capital he, meaning God, so God gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God gives grace to the humble. Jump over to verse 10 right here. He says, humble yourself in the sight of God, and he will lift you up. Who will lift you up? God will. If you have a humble spirit, if you have a humble attitude, if you are a person of humility, then you are not somebody who is concerned about gaining the stage or gaining the spotlight. Instead, all you're concerned about is loving God, pleasing God, and doing what God says. And in the process of doing those things, he exalts you. If God does not exalt me, I do not want to be exalted. Because the minute that I start to exalt myself is the very minute that I invite destruction into my life. I don't want to have that haughty spirit 
you know, in my life. I don't want to have that destruction come on me and cause me to fall. Amen? I want God to exalt me if I'm to be exalted. And if he does not choose to exalt me, then I am not to be exalted. Period. Okay? And then one more verse just to help us with our foundation here. And this is in 1 Peter chapter 5. Those of you guys who have been with me on Wednesday night or have been listening in on Wednesday night, you know how much that I love Peter. He's really ministered to me a lot this year. And um, just looking at him and looking at his life and looking at all, oh, man, he was so screwed up. (laughs) He was just so screwed up. And I can totally relate to him, okay? All of you perfect people out there cannot relate to Peter. Me, on the other hand, I very strongly relate to him. I relate to him being, you know, just feeling like he's got the answer all the time. I relate to him being the first one to open his mouth and shove in his big old foot. I relate I relate to all of those things, that desire to want to please the Lord, but then at the same time, that desire to want to tell God what he should be doing. I'm sure none of y'all tell God what he should be doing, but I often find myself telling God how he ought to work things out, right? And then I realize after a while, he's not listening to me. All you perfect people just sit there. It's fine. All right. So Peter, my man Peter here, he says in um, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, he says, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you. See, uh, the older people always like, see, I told you, you're supposed to be submitting to me because I am your elder. And they totally forget this next part. All of you be submissive to one another. <laughs> all of you. Be sit- We're going to talk about that more in a minute. And be clothed with what? Humility. Humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, and he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. So with all of those scriptures there as a foundation for us tonight, really what I want to put before you is that in this lack of leadership that we have, it's really because there's a lack of humility in leadership in the body of Christ. So if you desire to grow in leadership, which all of us should, we should all have a desire to grow in leadership because leadership is, what's the word? Say it. Influence, okay? Well, if you are planning on influencing anybody for the sake of the kingdom, then you're going to have to grow in leadership, okay? Everybody influences somebody, okay? Everybody influences somebody, and if we want to grow in leadership, then what we also need to recognize is one of the key characteristics of a true godly leader is humility, all right? So let's talk about some things. I got 10 things. Of course, it's a multiple of five, so I have 10 things. Ten things that are hallmarks of humility, because some of you might be sitting there thinking, I don't even really know what is humility. What does it mean? So the very first thing that that is a hallmark of someone with a humble spirit is self-sacrifice, okay? Willing to give of yourself, willing to give of your time, willing to give of your gifting, willing to give of your finances, willing to give of your best effort, Okay, willing to sacrifice yourself for the sake of the cause of Christ. Amen. You know how Paul said, you know, I die daily. Well, a lot of times, you know, you look around and you see people who are in positions and you think that person, they're not dying daily, (laughs) you know, because they're all flesh. People who, people who practice that self-sacrifice in their life are people who seek God. That's that very first scripture that we, that we talked about. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, okay? People who are willing to seek God, what they're doing is they're saying that, you know, my life, my ideas, me being in control of my life is not nearly as important as God, okay? I'm going to, uh, so it's going to be, more of him and less of me, right? Self-sacrifice. Um, one of the things that I had wanted to talk about tonight, and if I get to talk again about leadership at some point, then I'll probably bring this up instead, but um, I'd wanted to tell you a couple stories, um, mostly because I wanted you guys to know that Bev's not the only one around here who knows history. So, um, <laughs> but one of, the, one of the stories that I wanted to talk to you about, and, um, but I'll just mention briefly, um, is, is the story of... Um, of the exploration ship, the Endurance, which was captained by a guy of the name of Ernest Shackleton. It was back in the early part of the 1900s. And he is one of the natural examples 
of a leader who is, is just filled with this self-sacrifice, a humility that was where he was willing to lay down his life for all of his crew, for all of them. And it's a really remarkable story. There's a great documentary. Have you ever seen that documentary, Bev? Isn't it great? There's a great documentary called The Endurance that you, can, that you can see. And it's just a tremendous story about leadership. And this guy, you know, he was, it was a polar expedition to the South Pole, Antarctica. And um, it was like 1914 when they left. It ended up the short version of this. And I'll talk about it more some other time. But the short version is that they got trapped in the ice in Antarctica. Okay, so he had 56 men he was responsible for, and they were trapped in the ice in Antarctica for more than two years. Every one of his men survived. Every one. And every one of his men survived because of his leadership. He was, he was an excellent leader. Now, you talk about going crazy. You talk about being cold. You talk about being hungry. You talk about, you know, being scared. Okay, you talk about the harshest climate on the planet. Okay, you talk about being able to not just to survive yourself, but to see to it that all of your men survive. All of them survive. Now, they ate the sled dogs, but they survived. Okay, people are more important. The, the, the final thing, the, the, the long and short of it was the way that they ended up getting to be rescued was because he, as the leader, he was like, you know what? Die, die, probably die. If we keep sitting here, we're definitely going to die. You know, we're in Antarctica. So he ended up, you know, they got to a certain place. They moved from the location where they were after about a year or whatever, moved to another place. They're on this um, little island still there in Antarctica. And he got in a boat, went 800 miles in a rowboat. 800 miles. He had a couple other men there with him to help him out, but he went. He went. He didn't send the men. He went. 800 miles in a rowboat in Antarctica to find help and rescued all of those people. Okay? Now, that is an example of self-sacrifice. Okay? And it's a, it's a great example. What we see today in the body of Christ is a lot of people who are willing to throw you under the bus. Right? I'm going to throw you under the bus, you under the bus, and you under the bus because it's never my fault. You know, stuff is going wrong, but it's not me. It's that woman you gave me, oh, Lord, right? That's just like what Adam said. You know, it's, that, it's this other person. It's not my fault. And what we need to understand is that if we're going to grow in humility as leaders, then we are going to have to be willing to sacrifice ourselves. you got to put other people before you. You have to put the needs of others before you. You have to put the needs of God before you, right? So if God says, do you want to know how I was having this conversation with God yesterday morning at 7 o'clock because do you think I wanted to get up to be here at 8 o'clock for prayer? No, I did not. I'm like, God, why can't you tell Apostle David that we're going to have prayer at like, you know, 7 o'clock in the evening sometime when I'm already up? I have one day a week, one day a week that I get to sleep in. This is my whole conversation with God yesterday. I got one day a week when I get to sleep in, and it's Saturday. That's the only day. Why do I have to be at church at 8 o'clock? Well, because God said. And because God said it, it was more important than me staying in the bed. Self-sacrifice. Now, that just seems like a small thing, but yesterday was a big thing to me. (laughs) You know what is a big thing to you, right? You know what those things are that are pulling on you more than whatever it is that God is requiring in that moment. You know what would be easier. You know what would be, you know, and then you start this thing. (coughs) I just don't think I can make it. (laughs) Come on now. I'm not the only person who who thinks about this kind of stuff. All right. Self-sacrifice. If, if you're going to have humility, you've got to have that. You have got to, and this goes along with this. This is hand in hand. This is number two. Um, you know, you got to, you've got to put the needs of other people before yours. And if you ever want to see a good example of how this does not work in the body of Christ, all you got to do is feed people. You set some food out in front of some Christians, you're going to see a huge lack of humility right then and there. Because you're going to have some people running over other people to be sure that they get up to that line first. Right? First. They got some of Miss Marinelle's banana pudding on that table. I'm going to run five people down so that I can get some of that banana pudding before they do. 
We're laughing, but it's true. We, as a whole, we do not know what it is to put the needs of other people before ours. People who have been parents start to learn this better, right? I mean, when you have a kid and you really want this, you know, last bit of whatever it is, and your kid's standing there looking at you, their little quivery lip and their big old eyes, <laughs> and you give it to them instead. There were some times early on in Dave's and my marriage where, I mean, we were so broke. I mean, we were broke, 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 broke. We had rice and beans and beans and rice and rice and beans. That's what we had because it's cheap. So we had that to eat, and there was times where the kids ate and we didn't. Self-sacrifice. you got to put the needs of others in front of you, right? Well, I recommend to all of us that we think about, you know, when we have this compulsion to do something for ourselves, to grab something for ourselves, to say something about ourselves, to, to, to put ourselves out there, that we just stop and think for just a second. Is there somebody else that I can put in front of me in this situation? Can I serve somebody else's need right now in this situation instead of just making sure that my needs are met? Can I do that? Can I stand here at the door and just smile at everybody and just let everybody go on and get their food and get served and sit down before I sit down and have my meal? And so what? If Miss Marinelle doesn't have any more banana pudding left there on the table, it's all right. I know somebody else got some, and I can be happy for them. Right? All right. So here's the third thing. The third thing is that if you, want, if, you, if you really want to grow in humility, then you need to get rid of your need to be the center of attention. Okay? People who have a humble spirit don't need to be the center of the universe. Right? All of us have known people who really believed that the sun rises and sets just for them. Right? And some of these people have been just told that their whole lives, that, you know, they're so special that the whole entire world revolves around them. Well, guess what? The whole entire world does not revolve around you. It does not. Okay? And, you know, this is, this is evident in this lack of humility. Unfortunately, it shows up. If you've ever been to a leadership conference, leadership meeting, um, any kind of, you know, it's always like a top this show. You know what? I mean, I got this. I got this person in my church, they're so bad, yada, 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 yada. Oh, yeah, well, I got this person in my church, and they are so bad, da, 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 da. I mean, it doesn't matter what it is. It could be the good, the bad, or the ugly, but whatever story is set forth, there's somebody around there who's going to try to top that, okay? And, you know, and it's these leaders that they just keep putting this out. You can't tell anybody anything because they're going to tell you a story that's better than the one that you just told. And you might be telling something out of a sincere heart or just out of a conversation, No real motive behind that, but they're going to pipe up and they're going to tell you something that's better or worse than your story, depending on which end of the spectrum your story falls on, all right? Think. If we would just think, if people would just think for just a second, how much of your conversation is about you? If you would just stop for one second and listen to yourself, how much of the words coming out of your mouth are all about you? I am amazed sometimes at how people work this in. We can be talking about something completely and totally not even related to anything that they have to say, but they're just chomping at the bit, waiting for you to take half of a breath so that they can jump in there and start talking about themselves. And you're looking at them like, what? (laughs) How is that even related? That is so random. Where did that come from? Okay? But it happens all the time. All the time. You know, the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Well, if you are what is in your heart in abundance, then all you're going to talk about is you. Right? Think about that. People who talk about themselves all the time, that's because that's what their heart is full of. Them. Them. That's all they care about. Them. Amen. Don't need to be the center of attention. Modesty. Number four, modesty goes along with humility. I'm not talking about false modesty. I'm not talking about, yes, you know, people saying, oh, you know, you look great. Oh, oh, no, I don't, I don't. But then you're thinking, yeah, I do. (laughs) I'm not talking about false modesty, okay? I'm talking about the kind of modesty where, You praise other people for their accomplishments. 
okay, where you don't need to have all that praise. Where even if you do get praise for a job well done that you really did a good job on, that you are making sure, first of all, to give praise to God, okay, for whatever it is that was done that was done well, because surely if anything got done well that I did, it sure was God, right? But not only that, but you also are quick to give praise to all of those who helped you because you're not an island unto yourself. There's no such thing as a leader of nobody, right? There's lots of people that call themselves leaders. And I'm thinking, well, who are you leading? Nobody. Okay, that's, that's where I was back in 97. I thought I was a leader. I look around, nobody's following me. I'm not a leader. I just think I'm one, okay? So if you are, in, and you know, this, this is one of those things where, well, what if somebody on my team didn't really do anything? Well, give them some praise anyway. Praise their effort anyway. Give other people credit for stuff you did. And let other people take credit for things you did. You'll find out how much humility you've got going on in your life when somebody else starts talking about something that, that happened on a team or something when it was your idea. You'll find out real quick, hey, that was my idea. I'm the one who came up with that. Or, you know, I told them how to do that. I taught them how to do that. And here they are, and everybody's looking at them like they're the ones that came up with it, but I did it. Well, let people think they came up with it. Who cares? If you have to be the one to get the credit, then you don't want, then you're definitely not sharing that credit with God. Okay? So be modest. Okay? Share praise with other people. Sincerely thank people for the recognition that they give you. That is real modesty. A sincere thanks. Okay? Not a false modesty, but a sincere thanks. And then also that recognition of, you know, thank God, you know, right? Thank God. Being, and, and having a thankful heart towards others. So being modest. Being like that, number five, is being unpretentious. Turn with me to Romans chapter five. You guys all right? It's only 825. You should be fine. All right. Turn with me to Romans chapter 12 real quick. <clears throat> Here we go. Verse 3 says, For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you. So he's not just talking to the leaders. He's talking to everybody. Everyone who's among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to. Okay? Recognize that you are flawed. Everybody else around you knows that you're flawed right? Everybody around you knows that you're flawed. All you got to do is ask your spouse, and if you're not married, ask your mama, okay? Your mama will tell you, no, you're screwed up, baby, right? You, if you had just done this and this, what I had told you to do, then you'd be fine, but since you didn't do that, then you're a mess, all right? One of the things, one of the qualities, see, years ago, before I met this man, one of the things I heard about him from a Rama person was that he's just one of the most humble people around. But when they said it, it was derogatory like, you know, I mean, it was like it wasn't, it wasn't a good thing, not like they wanted to be humble, but you were humble. What I found out was what they really meant was that you weren't scared to stand up in your pulpit and to admit when you made a mistake, that you were you were, you were unpretentious. You know, you didn't carry around an air of being perfect. People who, like, carry around this air of, I don't make mistakes. Well, that's just pretentiousness. But if you're unpretentious, then you own your mistake. The first time I saw him stand up, and, and I hadn't even been here very long, and I didn't have a clue what he was talking about either, but he was, like, repenting to the whole congregation about something. And I was like, does this, I want to see your papers. I want to, because I don't really believe you went to that Bible school you said you went to, because I know a lot of people who went to that school, and I never knew one who would stand up and admitted they were wrong. Come on. A real leader will be unpretentious. A real leader will have this, this place of humility in their life where they're willing to be transparent and to say, I was wrong, okay? And to be able to admit and to share your mistakes. One of, the, one, of the, one of the reasons why we stayed, why we stuck in those first couple years was because of that. Because I looked around at a bunch of people who claimed to be leaders and who also claimed to be perfect when I knew they weren't perfect. And I didn't know how to grow because I knew I wasn't perfect. And 
I don't know how to change things when people around you have this facade of being perfect. You know what I'm saying? And so I'm looking around for, well, how do you grow? I mean, how do you even know the truth? How do you even figure anything else out than what has already been revealed? Because nobody's willing to say, look, we screwed up here. Let's try it different. Okay. And so, you know, having a real spirit of humility, you will be quick to say, you'll be quick to repent and you'll be quick to own your mistakes. And you'll understand that the sharing of that mistake does not make you less of a person, but in fact, it makes you a stronger person. And in fact, it makes you a more influential person because people can relate to people who make it through mistakes, right? Because we all have them. Number six, don't make a mountain out of a molehill. All right. People go crazy trying to, you know, make every little tiny thing into Mount Everest. It's not the end of the world. Okay. It's not the end of the world. And what that is, is it's a pride because, you know, it just, it gets, people get worked up into this frenzy about making this big, huge frenzy over just the smallest of things. And you're like, what's the big deal? It's not that big of a deal. It's not that big of a deal, but because that person is, has got pride in their heart instead of humi- humility, then they're going to turn it into a great big thing. People also do the flip side. You can do some little small good thing, but if you make a mountain out of that molehill, the next thing you know, then you're just as good as God. I was talking to somebody, teachers are bad about this. I was talking to somebody the other day, and, I mean, you would have thought they invented the entire English language. I'm serious. Just by, you know, some of the things they were saying, and they were just, you know, making this huge mountain of this little molehill. They're doing something a certain way, and good for them. Snaps. I've done it 10,000 times, but I was humble enough not to tell her that. (laughs) You hear what I'm saying? Hi, that's not been invented by you. People have been doing that in their classrooms for the last 20 years. But they thought that they were just doing the the greatest thing ever. And they're making this huge show out of this good thing that they did. Well, people make mountains out of those kind of molehills too. Be humble. Don't, Don't make a big deal out of the good things that you do. Don't make a big deal out of the messes that you make. It just is what it is. Be more of a realist, right? Just it is what it is. Number seven, turn with me back to that scripture in 1 Peter 5 that we read a minute ago. Number seven is be submissive. And I want you to go back there because some of you didn't like it when I read it before, so we're going to read it again. In 1 Peter chapter 5, where Peter says, okay, you younger, likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. The next part, if you do not have this underlined, do it now. Underline that. Yes, all of you be submissive one to another. See, one of the problems that people in leadership positions have is they don't think that they have to be submissive to anybody else. Okay? And just because you are submissive to Apostle David or just because you're submissive to maybe even leadership in the church does not make you submissive. If you are not submissive one to another, if we are not submissive one to another, then we are still not submissive, okay? Ask yourself this question. Can you submit to somebody who's younger than you? Can you submit to somebody who's not as educated as you? Can you submit to somebody who's not as experienced as you are? Can you submit to somebody who's not as good as you? Most people, you might be saying, yes, I can, but you know good and well, no, I cannot. And well, anybody but this person, because I know I'm better at that than them. Well, can you submit to them anyway? Can you submit to them anyway? All right. Can you submit to those people that you feel, not that are, but that you think are under you? This is one of the biggest flaws in leadership. People want to grow in leadership so they can be the boss of everybody. That's not the reason to grow in your leadership skills so that you're bossing everybody around so that now I got more leadership than you. And so you're all my friends. We all went to school together. We're all good. But now I got more leadership than you. So now you got to do what I say. No, we're here to be submissive one to another. You know, and this is one of those, there's a fallacy. I'm not saying that all of it is a lie, but I'm saying there is a lie in that relationship concept that we have about you have to have relationships with people who are over you, people who are on the same level as you, and people who are under you. And here's the lie in that. That implies that you are over people or under people or that you're better than people or that people are better than you. That's what it implies. 
And so what you do then is you go around, you thinking, okay, well, you and I, are, we're kind of on the same level here, so I have a relationship with you, but I don't have to submit to you because the only people I have to submit to are the people who are over me, so-called over me. I don't have to submit to you because you're my friend. And I don't have to submit to you because you're younger than me. Okay? And that, there's a lie in that. There's a lie in that. Okay, we have to build relationships with people all around us and we need to learn how to submit one to another. So, you know, if you um, if you ever work at Chosen, Chosen is one of those great models of this now because you've got people who they're not in a technical eldership position like, okay, Vicki is over Chosen. She's not an elder in the church. She's just now recently been made the youth pastor, but when this first started, she wasn't. But you've got elders in the church who are submitted to her because she's over that, right? And you've got people who have absolutely no position whatsoever in the church necessarily who've been put over areas and chosen, and if you go help them, well, then you're submitting to them. Well, it's a great model because that's what the church is supposed to be like. And you have to have humility in order to do that because if you go in there thinking, I'm not submitting to this 19-year-old so-and-so, I'm not doing that. Well, then you're not humble, and you're not a leader, Because what you're showing that 19-year-old so-and-so is that you are not willing to be led by them. Therefore, they are not worthy to be a leader, and you are not teaching them leadership. You're teaching them the opposite of leadership. See? And so that goes back to, you know, those people who have to be the boss of everybody. That's not leadership. In order to be a leader, you have to be submissive. In order to be a leader, number seven, and I mean, number eight, in order to have this humility, you have to listen to other people. You've got to be able to listen. John Maxwell says that the very first responsibility of a leader is to be a listener. When you listen to other people, you are valuing them. You are valuing what they have to say. Okay? I want to, I'm not going to read all of this stuff from Maxwell, but I just want to read these questions. Okay? And think about this for yourself. Do you allow people to finish speaking without interrupting? I used to be really, really bad about this, and I'm still bad about it. I I catch myself. I try really hard not to do that, but I still find myself because my brain is working, and I'm thinking of what I want to say, and so it's, you know, it's, it's one of those, it's a challenge for me, all right? But what that really is saying is that what I have to say is more important than what you have to say. See? Do you listen between the lines? You know, when people are talking, do you listen to what they're saying and to what they're implying? Okay? Are you just listening to their words? Do you actively try to retain important facts? Do you really work at it? Okay? When you're writing something down um, about a message, do you listen for and set down the key facts and phrases? Like, you know, do you take notes when somebody's talking and do you write down the things that are important? Are you doodling on the side of your page? I doodle. Ask Anessa. Sorry, Apostle. Sometimes I doodle. Actually, not usually when you're preaching, but I do sometimes. All right? Why? Because I stop listening. All right? Do you repeat the details of an interview to the subject in order to get everything right? In other words, when you're talking to somebody and you're really trying to listen to what they're trying to tell you, do you repeat back to them what they've said just to make sure that you heard them and so that they understand that you understand what they're talking about? All right? Do you avoid getting hostile or agitated when you disagree with somebody who's talking to you? Or is your side more important? Okay, are you a good listener? Can you listen to somebody who, does not, who doesn't think the same as you? Most people cannot. You can't. Do you tune out distractions when listening? There's some of you right now that's not turning out distractions. Okay, some of you right now are being distracted by things. Okay, so you're not being a good listener. What about do you make an effort to seem interested in what other people are saying? Some of y'all are not doing a very good job of that either right now. (laughs) Why? Because, you know, I'm stepping on some things that you don't want to attend to. You don't want to grow in in being a good listener. You don't want to grow in humility, so you stop listening. It's evident. You can see it on your face. It's up to you. Number nine, you need to be quick to forgive. People who are humble are quick to forgive. Mark eleven twenty five. 25, you know, that's that whole passage about, you know, speak to the mountain, be thou removed, be cast into the sea, do not doubt in your heart, all that. You know, everybody loves those first couple verses, 22 through 24, we love that. We don't love verse 25 that says, and when you pray, if you have anything against anybody, forgive them. 
okay? Because that way, if you forgive them, then your Father in heaven will forgive you <laughs> and cleanse you of all your trespasses. Well, we don't want that. We just want to speak to the mountain, right? That's all we want to do. If you are going to, you cannot follow somebody who holds grudges. Okay, leaders, people who are real leaders don't hold grudges. And so if you need, and that's, it's a prideful thing. People who hold grudges because they're, they're so convinced that they're right. And you might be right. But you being right to the point of not forgiving somebody makes you wrong. When you're walking in unforgiveness, you're wrong, whether you were right to start or not. Okay? So, you know, and then several different places. We won't read them now, but um, Matthew 5, 44 and Luke 6, 28. You can just jot those down. Matthew 5, 44 and Luke 6, 28. Jesus says that we're supposed to pray for our enemies. Right. right? We're supposed to pray for those who use us and abuse us and persecute us. Right? We're supposed to pray for them. We're not supposed to silently wish that a freight train would fall on their head. <laughs> an accident. You come up on an accident. Oh, I hope it's so-and-so. <laughs> don't act so shocked. Some of y'all have thought that before. You know, and if you don't think it, I mean, you're just in your mind, you know, you're like, yep, because, you know, they're going to they're gonna die because they wronged me, right? And they're going to find out. That's how they're going to find out. Jesus is going to tell them, see, if you'd only listen to so-and-so then you'd still be around. You need to be quick to forgive, folks, okay? If you're quick to forgive, then that makes you humble because you're not holding that grudge against somebody else. You're not holding it against them. Let God deal with it, and there's a thought. Just let God deal with it. Pray for them. Let God deal with it. Let it go. Don't sing it. Number 10, patience. People who are impatient are prideful, okay? All impatience is a matter of pride. I want it when I want it. I want it right now. It's all about me. I want it right now. I'm impatient. I can't wait. Yes, you can. Shut up. <laughs> yes, you can. You can wait, right? Impatience is pride because you are saying to God, I know when the right time is. You know, this whole thing about, you know, um, God will exalt me. In due season, hello, God, your clock must be broken because my clock says it's due season right now. So I don't know what your problem is, but you obviously lost track of time. You must have got busy. You lost track of time, God, because my due season is right now. What am I doing? I'm being impatient. I'm being, I am not being humble. I'm, you know, pretending like I know more than God, right? We have got to learn how to trust God for his timing. People who are humble know how to trust God, right? If you are willing to be patient, then what you're saying is you are refusing to make something happen your way, right? You're going to wait, and you're going to let God do it his way. And if it never happens, it's entirely possible it wasn't supposed to happen in the first place, <laughs> right? People who lack humility also lack patience. So those are ten things. So leadership lesson if you want to grow as a leader, you have to grow in humility. If you want to grow in humility, you got to work on those 10 things. Now, we could go to a whole lot of other things, but I think 10 is enough, don't y'all? Because in those 10, there are at least seven that I still need to work on. How about you? <laughs> Amen. God is putting a challenge out here to us right now because there is a void. There's a leadership void in the body of Christ. Well, who's going to fill it? The remnant. You listen to Apostle's message this morning about Nehemiah. Who needed to fill the leadership void? It needed to be somebody who was willing to step in there and take a hold of the remnant, right, and get them working all on the same cause, going in the same direction without killing each other, right? Well, that's what's going on right now today in the body of Christ. There's a leadership vacuum. There's a void. We've got to fill it. And God is speaking to us here at Gateway, and he's expecting us to fill it. God would not have Apostle David have us teaching on leadership unless we needed it, right? This is not just some, you know, time to fill. This is not fluff. This is like, okay, you know, you want to be serious? You want to really lead the remnant church? Well, you've got to do some things in order to lead the remnant church. And these tonight are some of those things that we need to do. Amen. Amen. Uh -oh. Linda, that was awesome. 
Not only was it a great leadership lesson, but it was right on time. This, this past week, uh, Logan and I went to Walmart. And uh, there's this movie out. It's on pay-per-view. And so uh, Geraldine paid to view. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, but what's the name of that movie, Geraldine? Something about, it's where this little boy, this little boy had a near-death experience or he actually died and he went to heaven. Heaven is for real. And Logan, we were in Walmart and he asked me, he said, uh, what do you think of that movie? Do you think that's, that's real? And I said, uh, I don't have any problem with it. You know, I don't have any problem with it, with the movie. Um, but I begin to share with him. Remember when Paul, remember when Paul was caught up to the third heaven? And he said, I saw things or heard things, maybe it was, that were not lawful to be uttered. Now, he wasn't saying it was against the law to talk about it. What he was saying was, is because I'm in third heaven, I'm in the realm of the spirit where God is, there are no words to describe because that's a different realm. When people have these experiences, when they go to heaven, this is what they don't understand. Is that the only way God can communicate us is based on what we already know. And so God uses things in heaven and if you'll listen to people, it's all about, you know, there's always the golden streets, there's always the, the gates of pearl, there's always Jesus and the other guys, and there's always, I mean, it's, and where do we get that? We get that because that's our image of heaven. And God is trying to communicate something to us. So the only way that he can con communicate to us, because we are human beings with human minds, and we're limited in our ability uh, to really be able to receive spiritual things, then he uses things that we already know to communicate with us. Does that make any sense to you? And I was explaining that to him, and I went on to explain to him, for instance, you know, the word talks about uh, in the book of Revelation where it talks about uh, what people call heaven. They, people preach and teach all the time that heaven has streets of gold, Gates of Pearl, la da 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 da. Uh, uh, well, here's what you have to understand. Uh, who said that was heaven that he was describing? If you go back and look, see, he said, uh, the, the angel said to him, said, now I'm going to show you the bride. We're the bride of Christ. I'm going to show you the bride. And that's when he saw the city. That city wasn't heaven. That's not heaven, that's us. That's a symbol of us. But everybody who has a, an experience or a vision or a dream, they go to heaven, then what do they see? They see because that's what they think heaven is. I'm not saying that the spiritual experience is not real. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that we need to understand some of these things. And so, so I begin to tell him, uh, you know, some of this and, I said, do you understand what I'm saying? He said, yeah, I see that. And I said, now listen to this phrase. Listen to this comment. I said, well, you know what that means? I said, that means that you know more than 90% of the rest of the people in the body of Christ right now. And I believe that's a true statement. If I hadn't believed it, I wouldn't have said it. And I was listening to the prayers tonight. We have revelation here that I don't know a whole, the whole lot of people that have. I believe we have the Holy Spirit leading us in a way that most people don't know anything about. Well, when those things are true, that means we're on a slippery slope because we can easily fall into pride. 
It's hard to be prideful if you're an idiot. But they do it. I mean, I've just, it's, it's a fight, but they do it. I've seen it. Let me, let me, but see, here's, here's the thing. We got to be careful, guys, that we don't start setting ourselves up above other people and other churches and other ministries. I'm going to, I'm going to point out, I'm going to point out the faults. I'm going to call the names. But I'm also going to understand this, that the reason I do it is not because I want to hurt them. It's because I, because I am under, I am under what a contract with Jesus. Amen. And he's put a ministry in me to do that. But the same, a lot of the same things that they are, the mistakes they've made, I've made too. Linda was talking about the Word of Faith people, the Rhema bunch. Most, the biggest mess you've ever seen in your life. I think a lot of them, or some of them I know, have come through it. But I remember, was it 97 when I went to youth camp for the first time? Now, at this time, see, before I'm a nobody. I'm just nobody. I mean, there's Dave. He's got a little building. It looks like it's about to fall in. He's across from Franklin County High School. And, you know, they're just going nowhere fast. He's been there for six years. Nothing's happened. Haven't grown. Nothing's going on. But then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, things start happening. Church starts growing. Start building buildings. Now I'm the man. Now we have now we have a minister's conference, and all these guys are coming in here to my church, to my success, where I'm the man. Because see, that's the and that's the set. I mean, so at that point, I mean, I got to have a Cadillac. I mean, you just got to. If you're going to be the man in the word of faith, you got to drive a Cadillac. You got to live in a new home. You got to have nice clothes. You got to have jewelry. You got to have all this stuff. Well, what you got to have is you better have some good credit. <laughs> and see, I had, to, I had to fight myself. I had to deal with that pride in me. And I remember it got to the place it hurt me so bad. And I remember somebody there t- said to me, said, because uh, we went out to lunch at youth camp. We went out with Phil and Cheryl Jackson, who were regional directors, and Southeast regional directors. And somebody says to me after the meal, they pulled me aside and said, you got it made now? I said, what do you mean? He said, uh, well, Phil and Cheryl like you. I said, they like me. And then they said, uh, yeah, I said, yeah, they like me. And he said, well, what? I said, what does that mean? He said, well, they're close to Brother Hagin. And now they will get you in with Brother Hagin. And that means that when you go to these big meetings where they got several thousand people and you know Brother Hagin and he knows you and they can get you in a relationship, and sometimes he'll call you up on the platform. Now, if Brother Hagin ever calls you up on the platform in one of his meetings, now you have arrived you're the bomb. I mean, people are going to line up now to touch the hem of your garment. I'm telling you the way it works, guys. And Linda knows a little bit. She was in, involved in it there for a little bit. And uh, I couldn't take it anymore. My spirit, I, I was so convicted that I just, I just started backing up. I remember uh, during this time, we went over to Phil and Cheryl's house uh, not everybody now. We ran a conference up there and just a select few. Geraldine and I were one of the select few that got to go over to Phil and Cheryl's house after the service, the last service of the conference. So here I am hobnobbing, man. I'm, I'm rubbing shoulders with the elite. With the, I mean, this is God's elect here, guys. Amen. And... Uh, so they had a photographer there. And the photographer was uh, taking pictures. And you, can, you and your wife could go have your picture taken with brother and sister Hagen. That professional photographer there. And so everybody's going and getting their picture taken. 
Geraldine and I talked about it and said, do we want to get our picture taken? Wouldn't have been nothing wrong with it. But I said, I'm tired. I'd rather go back to sleep. So we went back to the hotel and went to sleep. I missed an opportunity to get my picture taken. Now, what would that mean if people walked in my office and saw me with Brother Hagin? Man, the anointing would increase on my life like 100% right there. <laughs> but I deliberately did those things because I was backing up. I'm, black, I'm, I'm not playing the political game. I, I just can't stand the, that pride. I can't stand that positioning, that... Uh, I, it, 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 it was, it was, and now see, I was, I was, I was into it. I was enjoying it. It felt good. It felt good. Have you ever been the man? It felt good to be the man among my peers. You see what I'm saying? It felt good. I've made it, guys. Well, you can make it too. So what had to happen? I had to die. I had to die again. <laughs> Every time I think that I've reached this place of humility, I get lifted up in my pride for humility. I get so proud of my humility. <laughs> and then I have to die again. <laughs> I'm telling you, this is a word from the Lord tonight. Yeah, God's blessed us. Do we have truth? Yeah. Or is there a lot of error? Yes, there is. But we cannot get into pride because let me tell you something. Everything that we have here is because God gave it to us. When Logan, when Logan saw that check the other day, somebody sent me a tremendous amount of money. And we were riding down the road. And I said, Logan, I want you to understand something, son. I said, I did not deserve this money. Oh, yes, you did, Papa. I said, I didn't deserve it, son. And so we're going down the road, and he's telling me all about me and how I did deserve it. And I'm telling him, you don't understand, son. I know me better than anybody else. I didn't deserve it. It's a gift from God. That's the way you got to think about it, guys. Do we come to, do we have an anointing? Do we have a, 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 a unity? Do we have a love? Do we have a, do we have a truth? Do we have, uh, oh God, it's, all, it's awesome, it's wonderful. But I don't want pride to hinder what we got going. And we have to be careful and guard against it. This is, I know this is leadership. And I know why, I know now, I see, I, I remember when picking, because in prayer tonight, I was picking up things that different people were praying, and it was kind of pointing to us. Is it all right for me to say that? I love you, but I love us. But I'm, I'm thinking, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. And then she comes in with this humility message. It was the message for us. Now, why is, why is God bringing this up, Bill? Because of now the direction it we're taking. You know. Because we've accepted a, an assignment to, to begin to preach to, and teach the body of Christ. Bev, you were praying it out tonight. There's been a shifting. And so now God has to once again say to us, if we're going here, it's going to look like, um, it's going to look like again, it's gonna, we're going to look like we the man. We the, we it. I mean, we, this is what it is, you know. We can't accept any of that. We just got to do what God said day by day by day by day. Is this a wonderful night, my brother? It's a wonderful word from God. Amen. Pride is not, we can sit there in our smugness all we want to, but pride is something that everybody has to deal with. Every leader has to deal with. Everybody that's ever going to be anything for God has to deal with it. Amen. I know that... Uh, well, anyway, I won't go on. I've been, there's been enough good teaching here tonight. Stand up on your feet. Thank you, Jesus. Well, I feel pretty good. I don't know about you, but I feel like I've been fed today. And Amen. 
love most everybody. Some people I'm still working. There's two or three I'm working on. Come on now. I mean, I, <laughs> I'm just being honest. I mean, I know I love them. If I saw them hurting, if I saw them, you know, in need, uh, I'd, I'd help them. I know that about me. But I know where my mind and my emotions are sometimes. I'm still working on it. <laughs> I'm not going to lie about it like you would. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Lord, I love you tonight. Lord, I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful for you. I'm so thankful for this church. I'm so thankful, Father God, that you joined us together with these people. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You know what? People took my Bible for me. You know, I don't deserve that. People run to my, uh, what am I saying, run to my assistance. I mean, this people, like what we've been going through, Geraldine's not able to cook. People been bringing us food, uh, been bringing us canned stuff, been bringing us fruit and vegetables and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I've heard preachers say the oh, people ought to be doing this and your people ought to be doing that and the people ought to be doing this. No, 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 no. Shut up. Shut your mouth. And nobody owes you anything but love. Amen. Amen. I tell you what, I just have to say by the grace of God, I think different. By the grace of God, I am different. By the grace of God, I've got more peace. By the grace of God. By the grace of God. And I understand when I say the grace of God. Not Apostle David, but by the grace of God. So when people... And it used to be hard for me to receive that. For instance, somebody said, Miss Gill said, some folk are wanting to bring you some food. Well, I said, well, you know, I went to the grocery store and I bought all this stuff, corn dogs, fish sticks, all this stuff you can throw in the little oven and fix real quick, you know, because you ain't gonna have to, I'm not going to have a sick. But no, the, but she said, the, the people want to help. Well, I'm not going to take that away from them. Miss Faye, I'm not going to take that away from you. I'm not going to take if your, your ministry and your love and your respect and appreciation for me. I'm not going to refuse that. Not because I deserve it. Not, not because I deserve it. Amen. But I'm not going to take from you that opportunity for you to sow and be blessed. Amen. Amen. Well, I feel the Holy Ghost. So you know now I can do things, Roy. I can I can do I can give not but trying to get I can give because I love God. Whether I give any get anything back or not, that's totally up to God. That's not why I'm giving to start with. Amen. Now I can receive without feeling bad or guilty. Amen or anything like that. I mean, it's, it's just there's it's just a there's just another world of peace out there that we finally begin to tap into. Amen. All right, I better shut up. I gotta shut up. Somebody say, Apostle David, shut up. No, no, please don't say that. <laughs> Y'all come on down, come on down real quick. We're going, we're going, we're going. Hallelujah. Let's have a song together though, come on. Hallelujah. Just gonna sing a song and go home. Hallelujah. Remember the Wednesday night, there's no excellent teaching going on. Friday night, excellent ministry is going on, a different kind of ministry, but oh, there's just so much going on around here. Amen. Amen. Linda, I could tell you were mad at me yesterday because you had to get up. Uh, and I and I huh? Yeah, well I yeah, you, know, you look like you just left for a rebel out of bed. Since we're confessing our sins here, 
I woke up yesterday morning and I'm listening to Red Feather Crow, you know, and I'm laying there. And what I do is I, when I wake up, I just lay there a little while meditating. <laughs> and I was thinking about this Saturday, I don't have to get up for anything. <laughs> and I was meditating the word. I believe it was, I can do all things through Christ. I can do all things through Christ. After a while, I got about two or three, I can do all things through Christ. All I can do all, my God, I got prayer this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Did you forget it too? <laughs> uh, but to me, once we pay the price to get here, it's a, it's a blessing. It's an anointing. Amen. So we all wrestle with our flesh. You're not the only one. Amen. <laughs> now remember, pray for Randy. Randy's, you know, starts Tuesday morning, I think. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, a bit Gatlinburg. Uh, some of you might want to go. That'd be good. Father, we love you tonight. We're going to sing a song. We're going to go home. Bless you. You are faithful, Lord. God's blessed us in this house with uh, several teachers. Miss Gail just reminded me school started. And we've got teachers and teachers' aides and we got students. And so let's just let's just, just join our faith for them right now. Father, we first of all we want to thank you for our teachers. We want to thank you, Lord, that you've given us teachers and teachers aides and Lord people that work with school systems. And so Father, because Lord they do they have influence. And I thank you that the Spirit of the Lord rests upon them and they are anointed of you. And they have the grace that they need, Lord, the grace to do what you've called them to do. And we lift them up to you and we speak, uh, we speak your best and your highest and your strength, your strength upon them, Father, in the name of Jesus. And Father, we lift up those uh, students that we have in this house. And Lord, we thank you, Lord God, for your grace that's upon them and their families, Lord. And Lord God, that they're going to uh, excel, Father, excel in every area of life. They're going to excel in the classroom. They're going to excel in any other uh, activity you've got them involved in, Lord. We thank you for that. We thank you that where they go, that uh, uh, the Lord, people not, not know what it is, but that apostolic anointing that comes from you, Father, is going to rest upon them. And they are going to uh, be influential and they're going to be a success and a blessing and a blessing to this county, to these school systems, in Jesus' name. And all the people said, amen. God bless you. See you next time.